Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 779 for the 10th of September 2023. Richard Saunders here back at Skeptic Zone headquarters in Sydney, and I picked up a little bit of a um a, a virus on the plane, I guess, feeling a little bit rough. I'll recover. I'll recover. And it was a little bit of a um scramble to put the show together this week with all the international travel. However, once again, our dear Dear late reporter Shelley Stocken, who gave us such wonderful reports five or six years ago, comes to the rescue, a classic from Shelley from 2017, where she looks at Dr. Google. Always, always wonderful to hear Shelley on the show once again, and we miss her very much. Dr. Google coming up at the top of the show. Following that, I head to Sydney Skeptics in the pub fresh off the plane the other day. Somehow I made it to the pub despite jet lag. And I speak to Tim Mendham, the editor of The Skeptic magazine and longtime skeptic and coordinator for our prize, our $100,000 prize, Ian Bryce, a longtime investigator too. And we chat about the latest UFO fad, the UFO flap, the UFO shenanigans, insights from longtime skeptics. Following that, it's the Australian Skeptics newsletter, read by Adrian Hill, written by Tim Mendham. What is in the sceptical sphere of news and information this week? Then to round off the show, sort of harking back to Dr. Google, Trove looks at health myths, misconceptions from the uh, annals of Australian newspapers of the past. Now, before we get stuck into the show, a couple of notes from me. If you haven't heard the latest episode of Skeptoid with Brian Dunning, it's episode 900. Congratulations, Brian. 900 episodes. Ooh, I'm trying to catch up. It's worth a listen because it really takes a close look at some of the claims made by David Grush, the UFO exponent. And you're left scratching your head how congressmen, congresswomen, congresspeople and journalists can fall for this Grush guff. Grush guff. I like that. Also, The latest issue of The Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, is out. And those people who subscribe uh, to the digital version will have that in their inbox. And there's a couple of stories in there from yours truly. Check it out at skeptics.com.au. A big shout out to all my teacher friends here in Australia. And I know, I know it's not long before you have some holidays. Hang out for those. I know you do. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and have some chicken soup. Or maybe a nice dark beer. Mm. Hmm. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Interesting claims, questioning, take stock with Shelley Stocken. Hi, I'm Shelley Stocken, and this week I'm paying Dr. Google a visit. Back in 2011, Dr. Rachie gave a talk entitled Diagnosis by Dr. Google in which she discussed the increasing number of Australians self-diagnosing illness by searching for their symptoms on the internet. I'm interested in what's changed since then. So let's go back through the spooky mists of time. Not far, though. Five years ago, about 80% of Australians had access to the internet at home. Mobile devices were really starting to hit their straps as internet accessing machines, with about 11 million mobile subscriptions. And about 93% of people on the internet used Google as their search engine of choice. Even my dad was warming up to the idea that the internet was a faster and more convenient source of information than the local library. 
Now let's zip forward to the present day, or at least to December 2015, when the Australian Bureau of Statistics last published details of Australia's internet use. The recent figures show that roughly 86% of all Australian households are connected to the internet, an increase of 6% since 2011. There are just over 21 million mobile handset subscriptions, and Google is not only used as our favourite search engine, it's now one of our favourite verbs. So what's changed as far as Dr Google is concerned? A little, but not a lot. We still use the internet to research symptoms, medications and other health-related information. Perhaps because of this, the number of sites offering good quality, reliable health information has increased. Unfortunately, an increase in the number of sites offering evidence-based health information doesn't necessarily mean the proportion of reliable health information has increased. It's still very easy to find unverified, misleading or dangerous health information on the web and just as easy to post it there. And even the most reliable, evidence-based, trustworthy health information can be useless if it's used in the wrong context. Overall, we seem to be getting more innovative with the way we use the internet to manage our health, creating more convenient and interactive ways to get advice, tests and treatments online. For example, internetdoctor.com.au is an Australian site that allows patients to discreetly order sexual health tests online. And there are an increasing number of telehealth services available to remote and regional users, providing access to medical practitioners via online video consultations and other electronic means. As far as self-diagnosis goes, however, we seem to be in the same habits as we were five years ago. Google is just too damn convenient, if not completely accurate, to overlook as a symptom-checking contraption when you have a sore throat and you want to know if it's just a cold or that rare neck-eating parasite you've heard about. I decided to do a little experiment to compare Dr Google with real doctors. I entered three symptoms into Google one by one. For each symptom... I recorded the first three possible diagnoses that came up in my search results, regardless of where they came from. Then I compared those possible diagnoses with advice from a range of medical experts, including a GP and an emergency specialist. The questions I asked the doctors were, what would you ask the patient, what tests would you do, and in your experience, what's the most common diagnosis for this symptom? Symptom 1 was a three-day headache. When I entered three-day headache into Google, the first three suggested results were a brain tumour, aneurysm or migraine. The human experts I consulted would ask questions such as, what other symptoms do you have? What medications or alternative therapies do you use? Have you had a headache like this before? And what's your medical history? They said they would perform neurological tests for weakness or abnormal reflexes, check for fever and infection, and, depending on the patient's medical history, order CT or MRI scans. The most common diagnoses for persistent headaches are, according to the doctors I asked, migraine or tension headache. The next symptom I asked Google about was swollen ankles. Google offered up heart disease, kidney failure or liver failure as the first three diagnoses. When I asked my medical peeps, they said they would want to investigate any recent ankle injuries, any history of heart disease or varicose veins, whether the swelling is worse at certain times of day and the medications or alternative treatments the patient is taking. They would listen to the patient's heartbeat and check their pulse, examine the legs for DVT, check their lungs, skin and eyes for inflammation and, if heart problems were suspected, order cardiac tests such as an echocardiogram or electrocardiograph. The most common diagnoses for swollen ankles my experts came across were varicose veins and fluid build-up. The last symptom I asked Dr Google to consider was a sharp pain in the belly. Dr. Google quickly served up appendicitis, gallstones and pregnancy as possibilities. My real-life doctor people 
wanted to know how long I'd had the pain, whether I had any other symptoms, when the pain was at its worst, what my bowel movements were like, what medications or alternative therapies I used, what my diet was like, and my medical history. According to my chosen experts, the most frequently diagnosed conditions for this sort of abdominal pain are gastroenteritis and constipation. To sum up my not very scientific findings, there's no question that Dr. Google beats human doctors hands down for speed, convenience and the sheer volume of information it can provide for self-diagnosis of symptoms. But it's not nearly as good at asking patients the right questions and making educated deductions from patient responses as a three-dimensional human doctor. Google can't spot a skin cancer, hear a heart murmur or feel that squishy bit on your leg. Now, as in 2011, Dr. Google must be used with caution. Hallo an alle Zuhörer aus Deutschland und natürlich alle Zuhörer aus aller Welt, die Deutsch sprechen. Obwohl dieser Podcast Englisch ist, hoffe ich, dass ihr trotzdem Freude daran habt, die Interviews und Meldungen anzuhören. Ihr könnt mehr über diesen Podcast auf www.skepticzone.tv erfahren. Sydney Skeptics in the Pub celebrating, we think, we think, 20 years. Yes, 20 years ago we started Sydney Skeptics in the Pub and we've been meeting monthly ever since, apart from the COVID years, and even then we had online uh, presentations in the past week, just after I got back from my trip to the United States. Somehow I managed, despite jet lag, to turn up at Sydney Skeptics in the Pub to chat with a couple of long-time skeptics, our editor Tim Mendham, who you know from the Book of Tim and who writes the uh, the newsletter, and I also spoke to long-time investigator and challenge coordinator Ian Bryce. The topic: the latest UFO fad. Here's the man who keeps Adrian Hill in business, ordering a drink. It's Tim Mendham. No, it's not. No, it's not. Tim, you're ordering a drink here at Skeptics in the Pub. Yeah. Oh, you're ordering some food. You tap at the top, Tim. That's it. This is not alien technology. But speaking of alien technology, what is what is going on? I mean, it's it's like we've been transported back 40 years to the 1970s with all these UFOs everywhere. Everywhere, actually. Are you getting a lot of... Um, uh, attention, uh, interest at Skeptics Headquarters about UFOs? Oh, yes, all the time, actually, yeah. I know it, it, It's a big thing because it's suddenly... Everyone keeps talking about the Pentagon uh, information where they said, we don't know what it is, so everyone else jumped to the conclusion saying it's a flying saucer, right? No, no all they said was we don't know what it is. Had they spoken to some experts, they would have known what it was in about 30 seconds, I think. I think Mick West sort of... Uh, Mick West, yeah. Well, we, we've got the... And I was just speaking to you about this earlier today with Brian Dunning's uh, Skeptoid 900. Wow. Just deep dive into the whole Grush thing and yeah, the Congress. Yeah. And you're thinking, whatever happened to journalistic integrity and due diligence? Well, as a journalist, I can tell you, it, it uh, it's not dead. It's just lying in a gutter unconscious. Sort of. But I mean, it's having a drink like we should be, I think. Yeah, but I mean, and after the Pentagon, now the Grush things and everything, so it's yeah. really, really boosted up. And everyone keeps asking me. I get interviews, you know, all the time about UFOs and blah blah blah. And you, you were, was it just today? I saw an article where you're quoting. Yeah. That's right. We're talking about evidence yeah. for things, and uh, that was in the the Age, the Herald. The Age, yeah, 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 yeah. By written by a journalist who's actually one of our former. Media Award winners, actually, ah. Liam Mannix. But I mean, um, who oh, will be Mannix. who will be at our convention? Hey, hey, hey! There we are, plug. Um, but yeah, no, it was quite a good story. Just looking at you know what the hell do you need 
to prove one of these things, and I just said the evidence, basically, and there ain't none. Yeah, just just a, a bit would do, just a little bit. Any, a good evidence. Any, good evidence, and I always make the point that if you have one bit of evidence that's worth two out of ten, and you get five of those, that doesn't make ten out of ten. It makes five <laughs> times two out of ten. So, and that's why people say, all that evidence. That's all rubbish evidence. See good evidence. People got cameras on their phone. They got better cameras now than they've ever had on their phone. They got movies. Yeah. And yet movies. Got, yeah. Movies. That's how old we are. We say movies. Okay. Videos. <laughs> but I mean. Um, and it's still the same, same old cl- crappy evidence. It yeah. doesn't get any better. You think, must be something there. I don't know. It's very disappointing, but it's fun. Keeps us, keeps us off the streets. Gives us something to do. Thank you, Tim. So, <clears throat> Ian Bryce, the challenge coordinator for the Australian Skeptics, but more importantly for this conversation, a long-time observer of UFOs. <laughs> How many have you seen, Ian? How many have I seen? I've seen many things I didn't know what were <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah. Are you surprised that um, the fad has come around again, the wheels of time, the cycle? We're in another UFO fad craze. Yes, yes. Isn't that amazing? Maybe it depends on the um, refreshing of generations. In other words, the, the old people get tired of it <laughs> and you wait a new, a new crop could come along. Lots of things go in cycles. We used to test water diviners about once every decade, so that, that indicated... We did. That, we haven't done that for a long time. Over a decade, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But, but, but it does surprise me a little bit, but maybe you're right. I mean, a new generation comes up. They don't remember all the UFO crazes of the past like we do, like uh, my, my first memories of UFOs from the 1970s. And it was very, very um, in the media's attention, the public's imagination then. Yes, indeed. The idea of aliens is always intriguing, of course, but there seems to be a certain sect that wants to, wants to experience Invasion by aliens, yes. as <laughs> I, I think they've got some fun, unfundamental underlying problem in their personality. Well, yes, I mean, oh, that would be interesting to meet an alien, I wonder. Uh, but for a long time, you, you knew, and maybe you still do, uh, a man by the name of uh, Bill Chalker. Bill Chalker. Bill Chalker. I, him well, yeah. I haven't seen him for some time. Now, Bill, he was a supporter of UFOs, but he wasn't... He wasn't off the deep end, really, was he? No, I crossed swords with him many times, but he he was willing to look at evidence, which is a very good thing. So after a while, I just said to him, show me your best case. And he'd come, come up, he'd say, I've got a hundred best cases, just read my book. Ah, ah, that doesn't really help. <laughs> so I say, it might, it might be easier to address in a finite time frame if you gave me a single best case. And he said, oh, no, well, it's difficult to do that. Whatever I mention, you'll be able to criticise on some front. It's the cumulative weight of evidence that convinces me. So, cumulative uh, weight of evidence. So. And he was, I remember he had something about alien DNA, which I think there was a book about that. Alien DNA. DNA. Oh, okay. Or golden hair or alien hair or... Anyway, uh, uh, decades and decades ago and somehow we're not... Uh, we haven't be- become aware of it just yet, have we? <laughs> That's right. But of course, many people think the aliens are already among us, circulating, disguised as lizards. And <laughs> well, and amazing so the, the like alien... That. Oh, yes, of course. The aliens disguise themselves as lizards and those lizards disguise themselves as humans. That's right. So it all yes. makes sense again. That certainly does. You shouldn't be so sceptical. <laughs> That's right. And of course, there's the fairly recent uh, releasing of files by the UFO Defence Department, which bolstered the, the uh, yeah. belief in UFOs. The problem is there was, just wasn't any convincing evidence at all. So surely the absence makes counts as something. Um, Karl Popper said that the best way to, ref- to address science is to try and refute a theory that you want to test. Yeah, yeah. So it... What the corollary to that is that if, you, if you've tested a theory a hundred times and it's failed a hundred times, it's got to get weaker and weaker and weaker every time, in yeah, my understanding. Yeah. But Pretty UFOs don't, don't go that way at all. <laughs> it's all part of the conspiracy. I think you have to admit that. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. But oh, I, have yeah. got, I, have got a, I have got another topic, if you're interested. Yeah, yeah. Remember our mystery investigators where we... Oh, this the show for schools, of course. Uh, we did that. Our first show was 20 years ago. How about that? 20 years, yes. Okay. 
Well, there's an offshoot of that now. I'm running a show called Rocket Science for Kids. Wow. And that's, so it's got a little bit of overlap with UFOs. Yeah. Well, it's just a little. one is factual and one is, yeah. isn't. But uh, the kids are equally intrigued. And I'm giving that tomorrow, as it turns out, the advanced course. This is for primary kids, mind you. So nine and ten year olds. Because I've, I've given it a few times at, at Balmain Public School. And a few of the kids came up with the most amazing insights and questions. So I said, well, I'll write a version two, an advanced version, and that's happening tomorrow. So 40, it was going to be 20 kids, but then 40 put their hands up to come. So That's, that's, that's fantastic. What, what is that program called? Oh, Rocket Science for Kids. Rocket Science for Kids. Uh, is that available? Can people check that out online or is that something? Not yet. Not yet. No, I wouldn't mind. I've got to record, should record it at some stage so it can be published, published more widely. But maybe we'll talk to Richard about that sometime in the future. <laughs> I'll, have a chat. I'll, I'll have a chat. I'll have a chat to you. Rocket Science for Kids. Sounds like a great idea. Ian, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Thanks to Ian and Tim for chatting to me about UFOs. Keep your eye on the meetup, the meetup for Sydney Skeptics in the pub, and hopefully we'll have an announcement about next month, October, before long. G'day, Dr. Carl here, popping up on your beloved Richard Saunders podcast, inviting you to follow me on TikTok, where things are much faster. And it all has to happen in a minute or less. So why do diet drinks get you drunker? For example, a rum and diet cola versus a rum and regular cola. Why do we hear the ocean in a seashell? Is coffee good or bad for you? With regard to farts, what happens when you hold them in? And why do farts smell worse in the shower? And the old wooden spoon, as used in cooking, does have a very porous surface, so in terms of bacteria, is it safe to use? And of course, we all know that destiny shapes our ends, but so do the natural electrical fields that we generate, and marijuana munchies might be related to a 500 million year old mutation that makes eating enjoyable via our natural cannabinoids that our body makes. Just follow me on TikTok, at Dr. Carl, D-R-K-A-R-L, to find out the answer to all these questions and more. Hello everyone, this is Adrienne Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I'm here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. This is newsletter number 181. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's see what Tim Mendham has for us this week. Hi all, says Tim. We're into the downhill run for the year. Well, okay. It is just September, but it's downhill if you're looking forward to Skepticon, Bent Spoons, Convention Gala Dinners, and those lesser events like Christmas and New Year's. It's all going so fast. So get on with purchasing your tickets and nominating your perpetrators of Piffle soon. Read on, Tim. Okay, Tim. I'll do just that. Bent Spoon nominations now open. Your chance to nominate the wackiest or weirdest claim and claimant of the year. Nominations can be made at skeptics.com.au or by emailing to editor at skeptics.com.au. Woolworths Supermarkets Free Naturopath Consultations Raise Concerns Hundreds of free appointments with naturopaths have been booked through Woolworths' subsidiary Healthy Life as peak health bodies 
warn people are foregoing more expensive evidence-based care due to the cost of living crisis. Walkley Winner, now a leading UFO truther. The former 60 Minutes correspondent and gold Walkley winner, Ross Coulthart, has jumped into the spotlight with UFO claims and has been rewarded with a 2023 Bent Spoon nomination. Resurgent of Non-Doctor's Dangerous Legacy. Okay, for a start, Barbara O'Neill is not a doctor. She has no medical qualifications, even though she is claiming that title. But the banned naturopath has found a way back into circulation, which is a concern given her history of promoting dangerous and unsupported alternative medicine. Tick-tock trouble indeed. And I've watched some of them, and they're very cringy. Update. Skepticon 2023. Tickets for convention and dinner. Tickets are now available for Skepticon 2023, the 39th Australian Skeptics Annual National Convention. The convention itself will be held on December 2nd through 3rd at the Ian Potter Auditorium in the Kenneth Meyer Building, University of Melbourne, Parkville. There will be a Friday social event on the evening of December 1st, and a dinner on Saturday, December 2nd at the St. Andrews Hotel in Fitzroy. More information will be announced soon. Argentine government promotes brainwashing. They're not actually promoting it. They're saying it exists. Interesting but curious article from, quote, a magazine on religious liberty and human rights, end quote that discusses coercive persuasion, cults, human trafficking, and brainwashing. Fish oil supplements under question. There is growing opinion that fish oil in little pills don't make life better, certainly not your heart health, or for the fish. Nor do they offer protection against cancer. However, as a benefit for your heart, fish oil specifically omega-3 from actually oily fish might have benefits for your heart. How to solve the UFO puzzle. This is an interesting primer on UFO investigation. A bit simplistic at times, but a good and brief start to explain research and skepticism. How wealthy UFO fans helped fuel fringe beliefs. There is a long U.S. legacy of plutocrat-funded pseudoscience. The U.S. Congress just embraced it. And still more. Harvard professor suggests aliens are sending AI astronauts to Earth. This is a promo for a series of videos on pseudoscience. Avi Loeb is a theoretical physicist and is the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University. He is highly awarded, though maybe not for, quote, in the future, our AI systems may try to imitate extraterrestrial AI systems because they would be far more advanced. And perhaps once they reach similar levels that will usher our way into the class of intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, end quote. What's up with these wacky professors? The September 2023 issue of The Skeptic will be out in digital format in a couple of days. And the hard copy version is at the printers. It's packed full of essential reading and goodies. A special feature looks at the risks, the critics, and the hoaxes associated with the final and high-profile days of the golden age of parapsychology. There's also a review of the World Health Organization's promotion of Alt-Med and the rehabilitation of Yuri Geller, at least as far as the New York Times is concerned. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. You can sign up for a hard copy or digital edition, or both, since the digital is offered free to those who take up the hard copy version. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. 
items of interest. Self-moving stepladder misinterpreted as paranormal activity. This is an article that goes into more detail and explanation than you actually need on a haunted ladder. Or should I say, supposedly haunted ladder. Clairvoyants are actually AI experts. Brazilian psychic Athos Salome, the quote, living Nostradamus, end quote, has claimed that artificial intelligence is being exploited by fellow mediums and clairvoyants so they can, quote, explore time and space, end quote. Listicle, 10 great paranormal movies that aren't scary. Some older items in the list, but no Ghost and Mrs. Muir, no Blythe Spirit, and no Casper the Friendly Ghost. Any of those would have been better than Paranorman. And whoever said Monster House wasn't scary doesn't have little kids. U.S. dog owners skeptical of vaccines. And not only U.S. ones, but Canadian ones as well. Anti-vaxxers pull the woof over our eyes. A new study found that dog owners in the U.S. are growing more skeptical of vaccinating their four-legged friends, including to help prevent rabies. The study, published in the medical journal Vaccine, found that 53% of dog owners had some concern about the safety, efficacy, or necessity of canine vaccines. And this item left me feeling kind of squamish because Canada is considered essentially rabies-free, and I would hate that to start changing. And no, I didn't say squeamish. I said squamish. But they mean the same thing. And I'll discuss this more a little later. Silliest Mother of the Week. I lost my hair to illness. Mum says, ghosts stole it. Oh my. <sighs> <laughs> Alopecia is a real issue. Ghosts are not, and mothers can be wrong. Well, that's the newsletter. And for the Canadian saying of the week, I chose feeling kind of squamish. And I first learned of this expression recently while visiting my family in Squamish, a town an hour north of Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. Based on that information, you would think the expression hails from its namesake. But alas, no. According to my brother, whose wife hails from yet another Sydney, but this one in Nova Scotia, feeling kind of squamish is a common expression used in the maritime provinces on the east coast of Canada. And during my visit, we were discussing the Canadian words section of the Skeptic Zone when my brother told the story of how in the early days of dating his wife, when she wasn't feeling very well, she would state that she was feeling kind of squamish. You mean squeamish, he would say. No, she would reply, squamish. And since my brother and I are from a town called Squamish, you can imagine the confusion. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill. Hello, Skeptic Zone listeners. This is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Wikipedia Project. I also explore the world of psychic mediums, grief vampires, and expose their tricks and methods to exploit people. If you'd like to join me on this journey, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Psychics Explained. Or if you need help remembering that name, it's also Psychic Sex Plained. I think I'll get a lot more viewers that way, but please join the conversation and subscribe. Once again, to dive back into those pages at Trove 
at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. Of course, it's where we go to look up the digital archives of Australian newspaper history and magazines and other journals. How did reporters and publishers cover stories of interest to sceptics over the centuries? And this week I typed in a general sort of search looking for health myths. Now, health myths and alternative medicine have long been of interest to sceptics worldwide. So let's start our journey into the past in the year 1952. 1952, over 70 years ago, on the 31st of May. And this is in the pages of the Daily News from Perth, Western Australia. Melbourne, Saturday. City dwellers who practice deep breathing at dawn for health reasons should stay in bed longer and wait till the sun is well up. The air is hardly fresh in the early mornings, says the Melbourne Weather Bureau. In fact, the densest quality of dust is in the air between dawn and the time early workers leave home. Meteorologists explain that up currents carry away dust and smoke during the day, but a temperature inversion often occurs in the early hours of the day. This causes progressive upwards heating of the air to several hundred feet and dampens out the upward currents. 1952, a bit of deep breathing. And a little over a year later in the pages of the Brisbane Telegraph, the 10th of November 1953, craze is debunked, remarking that the chlorophyll craze continues, no doubt led by manufacturers for sale purposes. The Director of Health, Dr. Freiberg, in his annual report declares that chlorophyll has no magical healing, deodorizing or cleansing value. He says that during the year ending June 30, the Government Chemical Laboratory examined a number of toothpastes and toilet soaps claiming the presence of chlorophyll, and it was found that they contained negligible traces only of this substance. He adds that the latest chlorophyll claim comes from the dry cleaning industry. Certain firms advertise the use of chlorophyll, and extravagant claims are made as to its wonderful value in deodorizing and giving clothes lasting freshness. Dr. Freiberg says that chlorophyll, in the small proportions present in pills, toothpaste, mouthwashes, soaps, and the like, does not enhance to any significant extent the therapeutic value of the product. Now, stepping back a couple of years to 1949, on the 20th of January, in the Today Herald from Western Australia. Dietary Myths Debunked Despite propaganda about balanced diets, vitamins and hidden hunger, we know appallingly little about human nutrition, states James and Peter Fuller, and that's P-E-T-A, in the Reader's Digest for December. Quote, To the embarrassment of dietitians, a steady stream of fresh and conflicting data has issued from laboratories to challenge many food theories once trustingly accepted, end quote. The Digest article, condensed from the American Mercury, contends that animals, babies and savages, hmm, all ignorant of dietary theories, instinctively select the food that's good for them, unconsciously achieving a balance of proteins and carbohydrates. Examining nutritional vogues and beliefs, the authors say that yeast does have the B vitamins it has been credited with, but, quote, the trouble is it retains them, and even worse, steals some thiamine released by other foods, end quote. Spinach is a rich source of iron and calcium, but they are not in forms the body can easily use. High-protein breakfasts, held by many to be necessary, end quote, are shown by one scientist to be no more effective in sustaining industrial work output than breakfasts of cereal and toast. 
the vitamin theory seems to have been the, quote, most spectacular casualty of the war, end quote, the American Journal of Public Health reported last year. Quote, no indication was found that the use of vitamin pills amongst U.S. troops exercised any effect whatever, end quote. The U.S. Army Nutrition Laboratory found that true vitamin deficiencies are so rare as to be inconsequential. Quote, this sounds conclusive, but so have other pronouncements on nutrition in their day, end quote. The authors note, advising skepticism and examination of each new statement. Well, yes, that article ends on some very good advice. Once again, heading backwards in time, we end in the year 1938, on the 20th of August, from the Daily News from Western Australia. Fresh air cold cure. Debunked. Of course, you probably reply if asked, do you believe in fresh air as a cure for the common cold? But you would be wrong, according to Dr. Clifford Hoyle, who, as assistant physician to King's College Hospital and the Brompton Hospital for Consumption and Disease of the Chest, ought to know. In fresh air treatment, he said, it is the movement, temperature, and humidity which govern the stimulating effects. The idea that fresh air, as such, has any kind of miraculous effect in stimulating health or as a recuperative factor in illnesses outside these actions is a pure fallacy. It is the change of sense, the relief from the daily round, the alteration of rest and exercise and pleasurable company that give to the fresh air of our holidays an altogether undeserved reputation. And now let's look in the year 1951 on the 13th of May in the sun from Sydney. A doctor debunked physical exercise. Facts New York News Bureau. Psychologist Austin Henschel endeared himself to a large segment of the American population this week by announcing that exercise didn't seem to make men any healthier. Henschel, formerly of the University of Minnesota, examined 300 disease-free volunteer males ranging in age from 45 to 54 from the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. From this group, Henschel picked about 30 of the physically most active, those who had played competitive sport and had taken regular exercise all their lives. His conclusions? By all known methods by which scientists measure health, such as blood pressure, pulse rate, heart action, people who played sports are no healthier than those who don't play sports. Henschel checked his findings by re-examining a group of men who admitted that their main exercise for years had been walking from the house to the garage. He made them walk on a treadmill at three and a half miles per hour, gave them 56 other physiological tests, yet he couldn't find any significant difference between the health of the groups. Henschel did not decry exercise, but emphasized that it would build up stamina and strength as well as being good fun and mental relaxation. And finally, from the Sun from Sydney, dated the 29th of June, 1947. Dream death debunked by experts. Dreams cannot cause death, even for people with weak hearts, psychiatrists said yesterday. An anxiety dream could be unpleasant, but not to the extent of causing death, shock, must be real to cause death. The doctors were commenting on an English statement that a woman's death from heart disease may have been the result of a bad dream. The woman, a 39-year-old Margate schoolteacher, went to bed in good health. She was found dead next morning. A Sydney psychoanalyst said, If the woman had a weak heart, then that condition caused her death. The blood clot found alone was sufficient reason for her death. The psychoanalyst said that nightmares were caused by anxiety symbols represented in the dream. If a man ate too much before going to bed, his anxiety would be stimulated, causing a nightmare. Said a Macquarie Street psychiatrist, 
Although a shock could cause death to a person with heart disease, it would have to be a real shock, not imaginary. Coughing in your sleep could cause death if your heart were weak. Well, we've all had some pretty strange dreams from time to time. I wonder if you're like me, occasionally when you're just waking up from a dream, you have that uh, period of time where you can't decide whether what happened in the dream was part of your lived experience or just a dream. Especially if something a bit far-fetched or wacky happens in the dream. Sometimes I'm lying there just as I'm waking up thinking, did that really happen? So there you go, some interesting health stories, myths debunked, and so on, some uh, opinions from decades gone by. And you can certainly discover more health myths and uh, interesting things when you visit Trove at trove.nla.gov.au. Although normally we look for newspapers, we do look in magazines sometime, and there is a button on the page when you do your search to look for magazines and other journals. I should do more of that. Because... When you or I visit Trove, we never know what we might find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Hopefully by next week I'll be feeling a lot better. Coming up on next week's show, I don't know, it's a mystery. I don't know, I'll have to scramble around and see what I can find. But thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone at skepticzone.tv with your Patreon and PayPal contributions. Your donations and your subscriptions means the show keeps going. And it's time for me to go. I'm going to bed. (laughs) I'm going to bed and have a little rest. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the Skeptic Zone Studios here in Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X tiktok and youtube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via patreon or paypal the skeptic zone is an independent production the views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the skeptic zone podcast or any other skeptical organization anti-vaxxer anti-vaxxer <laughs> anti-vaxxers well those are those people who listen after the music yes i'm back in the skeptic zone studio so i have my dice contraption here thanks to greg deray from the bay area for that uh, dice rolling device i've got a 10-sided die this week and i've got my skeptic zone pad and pen this is where i roll the die three times maybe four and you use your magical psychic predicting special, <clears throat> you know, you try to guess what number's going to come up. Here we go. Roll number one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. Three. Congratulations to all those people who picked three. I'll just write that down. Three. Next roll. Here we go. There it is. Six. Okay. Three, six, roll number three coming up. It is seven. All right, today's winning numbers, three, six, and seven, and the supplementary, the extra roll, just for fun. Who knows? Two. Two. And as a special treat, I'll get two, two of these D10s, Roll them together. So now you have to choose a number. One to one hundred. One to one hundred. Here it comes. And we have sixteen. How did you do?